All righty. So we're going we're gonna to start with a little video of Noah's Ark. This was actually, what you're going to see was filmed in 2014. But this particular part of it wasn't released till this last August. Uh, I've skipped the beginning part because it's just useless. I want to show you the inside. The base camp that they had was at 14,000 feet and they went up. And in a rock fall mixed with a glacier, it's just nothing but they found a tunnel. There are two parts if you want to go to YouTube to look for this. Um, you judge for yourself. It's really amazing.
I've waited to see images like that since I was a kid. I think it probably is the real thing. Turkey. Eastern, northern, about 40 miles from the border with Iran. The video was August 14th, 2018. It was this last August. I can get you the information if you want to. The original footage was in 2014. And there's uh, also on YouTube, there is examining the same area. There's a team from uh, Japan. Uh, there's also a British team that have been there, but they haven't really made a big deal about it because I mean, think about if you announce Noah's Ark to the world. Can you imagine? So, and that kind of takes us into where we're going today, is the world is set up, they will accept anything but God. Period. And I've been showing you that over the last five, six times I've been here. Can we go up to the, up to some of the slides? Pardon? Um, I read in one place that they were doing that, but I've never seen any released from it. And I doubt they will. Yeah, you never know. Question. Well, it was on the surface. Why is it in a, in a cave now? Because they built a platform, a look, a view station the, uh, to view it up higher and see the entire thing. And the only thing that kept it from going down the mountain so are you talking about the Noah's Ark that is in the dirt down on the slope? It's an outline of a ship? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting thing. It uh, has roughly the same dimensions as the Ark. It has the form, and when they uh, magnetically survey it, this is way down on where there's no snow, it has magnetic things that could be nails in it, pieces of iron. It, it registers. So I can't really tell you. This is up really high, and it's really old. And the only way to get into it is through, there are, are two different places, but it's pretty hard to get to. So I, I can't answer that, and that's why I'm not going to leave it to you. Right. He did. So when I compare the two, the one on the ground that just simply has an outline, and I look at this and I see wood that has mortise and tenon and shaped and sawed, I'm leaning this way, me personally. Um, so I want to make a point this morning. I gotta go one more. I want to put the title up for Victor. So last time I was up here, I called it. Dad is telling us to stop hiding in the bushes. I'm referring to the Father, and I'm referring to the Garden of Eden, because the issue. There you go. The issue is, do you feel saved? I have a hard time with it still. I've studied for years, and I've been looking for something because I think there's something missing yet. At least it's in my life. If you have it, good. I'm happy for you. And that's why I'm here, to associate with you and to learn and grow with you. But there's always been something missing for me. Okay. So one of the interesting things that intrigue, intrigues me is why was it that we believe in our denomination? I've had interesting discussions about this. Why is it that Jesus wanted to pour out his Holy Spirit in 1888 at the General Conference meeting? Why is that? Anybody? It's been 130 years. He's not tried since then, although he's been leading, I believe. But that was a pretty direct thing. Now, we get that, that the Spirit calls you. It's what motivates you to, to search for him. Let's just manually click it forward. And another one. And another one. And another one. Let's stop there for a sec. Since the flood, man's intrusion on the earth has 
rather ugly in comparison to what God did. Let's go another one. So this is the general population of the earth. So what I want to do is I want to show you a little bit about what Satan's doing, then I want to show you what God does. So I don't know if, I, I didn't hear about this till this last week. There's a federal initiative that was enacted in 2005 that says by October of 2020, you have to have this little white star in a black, black circle on your ID, on your driver's license, or you won't be able to fly or go into any federal buildings. And the reported reason behind this is because when your picture is renewed and taken again, it's done with different software that puts facial recognition, your face into a federal database so that no matter where you are in the nation, whether it be in an airport or walking across a sidewalk, you can be identified. This is tracking and this is control. You can see how this is moving toward a final conflict between God and Satan and the followers of God and the followers of Satan. It's just another step. So this isn't just an isolated case. This is U.S. wide. Let's go another one. California. Let's go another one. Washington. Oregon applied for a, a delay, whatever you call it, official. We're a little behind. Let's go another one. So let's go up then from this movement, and I've showed you many other ways that society is being encapsulated and forced. So this is the end of the great controversy. We're standing right in the middle of it. This thing keeps coming up. You have three cities in the world that are sovereign states. Washington, the city of London, and the Vatican. They, are, they have their own tax system, their own police, their own education, their own utilities, everything. They're independent. We don't think about that much in Washington, but it is true. So let's go another one. And, that's, and each one of them has an obelisk. So you got to think about this. Why in the world would you take something from ancient Egypt? It's so important that you have to erect it today. Why not take something from Rome or the ancient Greeks or whatever? Why that? It, just intriguing. But it's unity. And it's in a sovereign state that can't take orders from anybody. Let's go one more. This is the, the obelisk in uh, London. It's big. It's almost as big as ours. Go ahead, another one. So this is called the Golden Mile. This was uh, actually put in effect back before 1870, but at the time this map is there. A mile has um, <clears throat> 640 acres. This actually has 677, I believe. And it is the banking district. All the banks in the world are controlled from this spot, and I watched a documentary on banking that said that as of the fall of 2017, all of the world's financial in infrastructure was now linked and owned, because you need a minimum of 5.5% interest in the ones that you own. They own them all. They run the entire world. Now that's rather interesting. You've got a sovereign city-state that's not accountable to anybody. And for instance, when the Queen makes her, the Queen of England, makes her annual pilgrimage to the, whatever she goes in here, she's not allowed to wear any of her monarchy dress regalia. She actually dresses like a soldier. She has a uniform that's been made for her. It's modified to look like women. It's brown. She can't wear any insignia at all in what do you call it? Obeisance in submission, observance to this state. Now, it's kind of the same thing in the Vatican. Women wear the black headdress. I don't know what they do in Washington. Let's go another one. But they have their own unique things. And so this is from Wikipedia. It was actually turned over in 1649. So I'm looking at that and thinking, hmm. The time times and half a time ended in 1798, so long before the, the beast power, America, with a lamb-like horns took over, Satan was already moving to control it, to guide it along his. He was, had a parallel move and an interest. He's never, ever let go, even for a minute. So one of the issues that happens in America is we think we're free. You know, that may not be as true as you think it is. Let's go another one. So when you go above that structure to the peak, 
you find statements like this. This is Manley Hall. Powers beyond and above human corruption are the only ones capable of governing the new world order. Above human. Just flat out stating it. Let's go another one. And so this is just a diagram, and this one was interesting. None of these come from Christians, by the way. At the very top is non-human entities. Non-human entities running the whole show. And this stuff has all been coming out in the last few years. It's, it's achieving a faster and almost frenetic pace. I'm telling you, we are there. Let's go another. So Terence McKenna, I've heard him talk different times, but not a lot. He says, we are part of a symbiotic relationship with something which disguises itself. It disguises itself as an extraterrestrial invasion so as not to alarm it. An extraterrestrial invasion is what brings to my mind is when Paul talks about there's a deception coming at the end of time. I think this is probably a huge part of it. Let's go one more. <clears throat> this is a UFO taken from a live video. And the first thing you're going to think of is some of you believe and some of you don't. Don't insult my intelligence by telling me you don't, that I'm nuts. I've seen these things. I would never say that. Paul. Thank you. I have seen them. This one is called the TR3B, and it's made by Lockheed Martin. And it uses physics that kind of have been kept back from the public. We already know in the last two or three years it's really come out. We know how they float. We know what anti-gravity, how it can be achieved. So it is nothing more, to use an example or an illustration, let's go back to when the Wright brothers flew the airplane. Remember when they're standing on the dune? If you would have told them that you could get over a million pounds into the air on a 747, they would have looked at you and said you were absolutely crazy. A loaded 747 can carry like 1.2 million pounds, 1.185 million pounds. All this is, if a 747 is the Wright Brothers, this is the 747, that's all it is, it's technology. And I can show you the math and how they work. It isn't that difficult, it's just weird to us. Let's go to the next. This is a, I want to stop right there and just kind of clarify where we are now. So what we're facing, when you look at all the different things, I so showed you Astana in Kazakhstan last week, or last time I was up, it's the religious, it's going to be the religious world headquarters. We are facing some big giants. Technically, there's no way we'll ever even walk through it. It's that vast. It's way bigger than I've even been showing you. I've just been picking the pieces out. So this drawing was made by, based on bones found in Lebanon in 1947. I've seen pictures of the bones and the workers standing around and looking at it. This is what Israel ran into the first time when they went through the desert. This is approximately correct. There's Caleb down in the bottom, that little guy right here. If you think that you can do it by yourself, you cannot. This has to be a God thing. They could never do this by themselves. You had walled cities plus giants. I mean, that's intimidating, right? Well, so is universal facial recognition and enforced days of worship coming. And by the way, Germany has it, and so does Greece. Germany asked for it, and it was forced on Greece when they took the financial bailout to stabilize the country. This, this is, if you want to look this up, this is Caleb, and that's from Numbers 1330. Let's go another one. So, you have, if you, this, is, this is where I went. How do we overcome? Where do, what do we do today? Where do we go? And the answer, God already gave it. See, the Israelites crossed when they had recalibrated and they, all their influences were long behind them and they only spent time with God. And that's the key. The world was shut off to them and they only knew Him. 
That's it. And as the, because when your self fails, slides away, you also understand that God can come in and it becomes Him replacing you in you. And that's why He said, I think, let them make me a temple. I want to dwell with them. They're my kids. And His ultimate goal is, we'll get to that, I think it's literally the Holy Spirit comes to you and infuses you and he tried that in 1888. That's his goal. It's been that all the way along. Let's go another one. See, this is, this is what they followed into, into Canaan, right? They crossed the Jordan with this. So, you recognize the Ark of the Covenant, the angels, the mercy seat, and I said this last time, where is man's place in this? It's on the mercy seat. But we don't like to draw it there because we're unsure and a little afraid. So just draw it in there in your mind. Put you right there in the middle. And what it surrounds you? Presence of God. You have all of the New Testament that makes it way clearer. See, this is the only thing that gives me peace. It looks like my God wants me to be comforted and let Him in. It's like he's saying, this is where humanity needs to be in order to live. And I, I keep going back here because this intrigues me. I think it's right. Let's go another slide. So when I read this, and I've showed this at least twice already, this just blew me away. This is from Steps to Christ, page 52. He is waiting to strip them of their garments stained and polluted with sin, and to put on them the white robes of righteousness. He bids them live and not die. For 45 years I've studied that and just can't get it until one day it clicked. If His Spirit comes to me like a lot of rain, outpouring of the Holy Spirit, infuses me and, and I want it, then isn't, don't I now have His righteousness? If His influence is there and around me, would I not want to be obedient and now have His strength to make the right decisions, see where the pitfalls are and step around them? To me this makes sense. But I like that. He's waiting to strip it. It almost sounds like He just wants to yank it off enough of this already. Let's go to another one. See, that's what I said last time I was here. This is my hypothesis or model or whatever. I'm putting that out there to see if it works. If it doesn't, we'll adjust it. But I think He wants to directly connect with you from the throne. Period. And as I was thinking about that, let's go to the next one. That's where I got the idea of Adam, stop hiding, by the way. It occurred to me that that is the Gospel. Satan is God is burrowing around and scurrying like rats through a maze, worrying about obedience, worrying about this and that, and yet look at this. Maybe the whole point has been since the beginning for us to get out of the bushes, go back to God, to realize that you can and that you're free to do it. Amen. Period. If we let him. If we let him. And he'll come to you. He said, I'm knocking. Right? So, as I consider that model, all of a sudden then this other stuff starts going away. I'm not quite so worried anymore. I like that. Because now I have a purpose for my life. I'm going to be 60 here in a little over a year, and I don't, it seems like yesterday I was 30. You guys don't know what that's like. Let's go another one. See, look at this. Great Controversy 477. We may go to Jesus and be cleansed and stand before the law without shame and remorse. I get to let my guilt go. I let my uncertainty go. And it's because, I think, His presence in me. But there's a couple issues you still got to work out, but we're going to talk about them. Let's go to the next one. 
See, now all of a sudden the Bible text in the New Testament starts to pop. Look at this one. He that abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. How much clearer does he have to make it? And yet I never saw that for most of my life. Not till the last couple months. Even in men's group I was saying it, and I, I could see it, that it was true, but it just didn't quite have the mechanics of it. But I saw it. It's just got to be. Let's go another one. So here's the issue. You, even if you see that this is the answer, we hold back a little because we just kind of not sure. You know, does God really, is he going to take care of my sin? What about my tendencies to go on sinning? I can be a real bear when I'm tired. I, you name it, we all got that issue. Let's not even go there. So I think God has a solution for that. Let's go another one. See, remember this? This is what uh, Jack Sequeira said that kind of, the, he was going over the history of the Adventist church and, and religion in general. But he said that after 1888 and all that stuff into the beginning of the 1900s, we kind of came to rest, as it were, on our error route and said, well, I'm going to do the best, my best, and then he can make up the rest. That was kind of the, the attitude of the Adventist denomination because we didn't get it. It was, and we thought that that was safe, and it was for the time. But I don't think God ever intended us to stay there. Let's go one more. It's the best we can do, right? So I want to propose a second hypothesis or model. What do you do with that? What do I do with that to find the peace of my Father? Let's go in one more. I have to realize something. Every one of you is saved, and me. Period. You don't qualify it, it's not you. All you actually have to do is really, if you've accepted Jesus, that's the biblical standard, you're saved. So go from that point. And maybe, and I'm talking to me now, when I have doubt, I need to go back here and say, just a minute, I have a connection with my Father. He desires me. I'm going to put my problems over here for a little bit, and I'm going to dwell here. Like Paul said, I, I want to only look, look to the cross and Him crucified. It's the same thing. Understand that you are linked to your Father. Pardon? If you let him. We're so eager to throw that out there though. Have you noticed that? When I talk to people in my office about this, and I'm talking a lot of different religions, they all get it. But that's the first thing that comes out of our mouths. I want to propose a different thing. Be like the people when Moses told them at the Red Sea, stop and shut up. Watch God work for you. How about you don't say anything and let him be your God? Let's not qualify it anymore. And I, I don't mean that insultingly. I'm just saying, because I run into that all the time, even in me. And I finally realize maybe I don't have to. I can just simply be here and let him be my father. I'm not going to oppose him. Let's go another one. And this is kind of an explanation the Holy Spirit has been calling you. It's calling all the people of the world. But it wants not to stop, but to grow something more. He's bigger than you. And the trouble is we're afraid of that. But I choose not to be afraid of that anymore. One of the first things that happen is when I see this, I'm a little nervous. It's kind of like Israel when they're sitting at the foot of the mountain, God spoke and they were scared. I'm going to remember the Jesus who came and healed people and spoke gently and the kids ran to him and weren't afraid. When I think of my God is scary, I'm going to go back to Jesus because he says that other is essentially a lie. My father and I are one. That's where I'm going to put in that picture. And it takes the fear away. Let's go another one. I'm trying to hurry, Jerry. So Paul actually said this. He said, uh, well, yeah, you're... You're dead under sin, but you're actually alive to God. He's really saying, yeah, you got a conflict. Yes, you're still sinners, and you still see the truth. But the big thing that I want for you to understand is that you can still go to your Father. It doesn't matter. You can go to Him with mud on your boots. What are you trying to fix it yourself for? 
You don't have to qualify yourself for him. You just have to go to him and let him in. Turn your gaze to him. Let's go another one. This was the qualification of salvation in the entire Bible, not a denominational standard. We have some regrouping to do on this one. This is the standard. It's not whether or not you drink tea or coffee. It's this. I have a uh, friend who I saw this week in my office. She's a Jehovah's Witness. And she means well, and she knows her Bible, and I love her to death. But as we were talking about these subjects, she asked me, do you want someone to come study with you? No, I don't. I'm already studying, and I'm finding my truth. And I'm not knocking her, but what she does, and what I used to do, is I refer people to my church because I didn't get it. And it, all this is simply, and you'll find this in every denomination, everybody does it, they found purpose and peace and a connection with God in their church, and they want others to see it who they see are stumbling or having questions. It's perfectly fine. If they want to go, go. You'll find your father whatever path you're on. He is in charge, not you. I don't worry about that anymore, and I have great relationships with... Because you've got to go back to here. That's, it's God's deal, not yours. Let's go one more. That may sound like heresy to you, but you can come talk to me about it, and I'll talk in return. If you can show me where I'm wrong, I will bring it to the church. See, this thing is about quickening. The more the Holy Spirit comes, your spirit is quickened, and ultimately in Romans, Paul says that it's quickened so much that it takes you to heaven. It's the Holy Spirit. Let's go another one. Look at here. This is the granddaddy of them all, or grandmummy. Who hath saved us and called us with the holy calling, not according to our works. It has nothing to do with us. Thank you, Father. That's where the comforter comes in. Because it shows you it has nothing to do with you. And you trying to qualify yourself. No, you just stand there and let him in. It's really that simple. But it's according to his purpose and grace which were given us before the world even began. He's always wanted us to go home and to be linked with him. That's the whole point. That's the gospel. Next, qu next slide, please. This is what the Holy Spirit did. It fixes. You can't. He can. Black and white. Let's go another one. He gave us the example of the, what does the Holy Spirit do? It creates, renews, restores, builds up and up and up in its presence. What do you think it would do to you if it was in you? It's not that hard. Let's go another one. So here, this is it. I don't feel that I can go stand there, but he says otherwise. And so, the answer to this, you almost need to put a third hypothesis, and this is the end. There's one thing that I can do, actually. But it's, a, it's not an aggressive thing. Go sit down somewhere and pray. This is why it says to say what you have to say. And I have discovered, stay there. Don't hang up the phone. You probably won't hear anything, but stay in connection. Because we already know enough now that when you pray, you're connected directly to the throne. This is like a first step of the outpouring. Do you remember when Jesus said, my house should be called the house of prayer? That's why. It's because the connection is growing and building and building. And it's why Satan tries so hard to fill our lives with so much stuff and worry and concern that we never do it. Not near enough. So if you want to be offensive... Start shutting it down. Forget about Facebook. Turn off the TV. Go garden. Go mow your lawn. Go chop a tree down. Do something physical because it'll clear your brain. And then when you're ready, go sit down and spend time with your father. Just say, you know what? I got nothing. 
It's interesting that on the Mount of Beatitudes, it was the people at the bottom of the social hierarchy were the only ones who got it. It's because they had already thrown aside everything and they were actually willing to let them in. All of this stuff gets a lot clearer. And you know, it's only been in the, that this is really sharpened even in the last couple of months for me. I never saw this before. So you may get the gospel. You know, I'm so happy for you and that's why I'm here to associate with you. Because a family is the whole point. And we all learn from each other, but we're all on different paths. This is my path. I'm looking and searching. I want to know this. And I want to experience it. And I believe we can. So thank you for your forbearance with me. Yes, Pastor Phil. I saw a signboard in 1970 at a church that impacted my life and my hope ever since. It said, you've talked several times about it's simple, it's simple, it's simple. The signboard said, when I try, I fail. When I trust, he succeeds. <laughs> Did you all hear that? He, he saw a sign that said, when, when I try, I fail. When I trust, he succeeds. Did I say it right? Yes. You know, you can actually let go here and just kind of fall into that. This is a new era that the Adventist church is facing. And there are a lot who reject this. But I don't, I'm not, honestly, that's not my concern. My concern is my connection with my father and spending time there. I'm going to put him in charge, not me. I can't. So this church and all the churches and all of his believers, that's his business, not mine. My job is to stay in connection with him. That's it, and it's yours. Stay in connection with your father. Well, I hope I've given you some interesting things to think about, a different way of looking at things. Talk to me if you want any of the information, addresses, blah, blah, blah. Let's bow our heads. Father, I think this is the truth. I think this is how you see us. I think this is the end of the Reformation, the truth that you've always wanted to show us. We would love to ask of you more, and so we do. Father, please send your spirit to us. You're gentle. You never disrupt us, but you always lead us to you. So let's quicken the pace a little bit. We want to experience you firsthand. So we simply ask, as we're instructed to do so, please come. Be with everybody today, their fears, their pains, their anxieties. Can you please put those to rest and replace it with a sense of you in a very real way? That is my prayer to you this morning, Father. Thank you. Amen.